have done almost no research on you. Perfect. So I apologize for that, but I feel like it'll be better for anyone who watches this because, yeah. you know, just start from the beginning. I think research would only ruin, uh, yeah. it would only ruin your perception of me. <laughs> like, let's like start while it's so high. Totally. When people <laughs> say like, I follow you on Twitter or I read your blog, I'm always like, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I sometimes, I, <laughs> I'm in an interesting predicament where at, at the low, at sex parties in New York City, um, I might introduce myself to someone at the play party and then they'll be like, oh, do you, are you the one with the podcast? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, they're like, oh yeah, I've heard of you. And then I'm always like, that's either really good or yeah. really bad. I'm not sure which way it's swung, <laughs> but uh, hi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's like uh, people have heard of me only at Brooklyn sex parties. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a good, good crowd to be famous, semi-famous among. Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> um, so yeah, tell me about what, you said you started your podcast to interview people that you have dated. Yeah, I, I, I started in 2014 talking to like women I'd hooked up with about sex dating and why we didn't work out. So that could have been like one day or hook, like one brief hookup. That could have been someone we tried dating. That could have been an ex-girlfriend. Um, I didn't really have ex-girlfriends at the time because like the whole issue I was having was a lot of women were willing to sleep with me, but they didn't want to date me. Classic girl problem usually. Right. Typical gender role reversal. I think that's also why a lot of women like connected with the podcast so early on because they were like, oh, like that, that sweet boy has the same problem as me. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, like I wanted romance. I wanted cuddles. I wanted all the love stuff. But you know, anytime I wanted to uh, escalate in a, rela a relationship, she would always tell me she wanted to keep it casual. And the other odd part was it wasn't like they just lost interest and were done. Like I would want to date. They'd be like, let's just fuck. And then they'd keep fuck. Because normally when you bring up that, that conversation, if it's not compatible, you go your separate ways. They were like, Oh, no, 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 no. We're going to keep you around. You do that thing I like that you do with the tongue, but can you just keep the love shit to yourself? Can you shut the fuck up? That's what they want. Um, they were like, they wanted to use me, not love me. So I just, after it happened for the umpteenth time where I had the strong connection, and then it's just like, it could have, I was like, let's ask them. So it seems like you have not learned to shut the fuck up. No. Uh, but no. did you learn anything useful? Did you see any, have you seen any patterns? <laughs> One, I will shut up if somebody interrupts me too, because I know that I ramble. I know that I can be long-winded. So like, if someone interrupts me, I'll be like, okay, yeah. Uh, no, I've learned, a, I've learned a lot of things. Uh, I think more recently I've been thinking about like my perception of the history is, is definitely not always maybe the objective reality, which is like, that's a long lesson to learn. How many fights are simply like, we both experienced the exact same thing in totally different ways. Or like, I forgot, oh, I forgot that text message I sent. That one was really bad. I'm sorry. You know, so there's, um, I've been doing a lot of like self-reflection last, you know, year and a half or two. Totally. Yeah. I was watching Love is Blind, the like reunion episode last night. Okay. Um, cause I'm a hip happening girl with a, with a happening life and, uh, refined tastes and, you know, I watched it not as long ago as it came out, I think. I don't know. It doesn't feel like it's been two years. But um, this one woman was saying about how she doesn't remember what she did that other people, uh, this one couple in particular, doesn't like her. Mm -hmm. And, like, it's on film. Like, everyone knows what you did. We can go to the tape. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but she, just, he, she doesn't remember. And I thought about how, yeah, I'm the same way. Like, some of you will not like me. And it'll be vivid in their memory what I did. And for me, like, I might have never known. Because we're all an unreliable narrator. Totally. And I think that that's, like, kind of a level you get to in relationships where you realize that, like, there is no truth. You know? I feel like couples go around, or people in relationships go round and round about this happened this way. And no, it happened this way. And it's like, it doesn't matter. And it there's no objective way it happened. Like, something happened. However many people perceived it, perceived it their way, and no one's view is the right way. And so, like, once you get past that, let's establish the truth, and you get to let's establish how we feel, mm -hmm. what we need. Because that's ultimately the more important thing. It's like, <clears throat> unless it's something, like, really monstrous, like the thing that we are arguing about whether or not it happened or how it happened, ultimately it's like, and how they make you feel. And it's like, if, we, if I can let go of... If, when I've started to realize I can just let go and accept like, okay, I don't have to agree on the what, but like clearly there's an emotion happening. Let's see if we can do that. And that's like a skill set I'm hoping to like take moving forward, um, like being in the dating world again. Totally. Yeah. And do you think that, 
I feel like not the sexiest answer. I'm so sorry. I wish it was just like I didn't eat pussy as well, and then I got better at it. And like, right, it's like then. <laughs> but unfortunately, you started out amazing at eating pussy, and you just had to get better. At just a, it. just a natural. I had to get better at the emotion communication <laughs> shit. You know, I will say, like, I have never been asked the questions that you asked me when you interviewed me. And I've never talked about that stuff on podcasts before. I mean, the vast majority of the podcasts I do are about politics. So, yeah. um, that's part of it. Which we did get a healthy dose of. We did. And I thought, like, that might be a really good bonus episode I can clip out. <laughs> <laughs> In case you haven't got enough of Caddy's politics. Um, but yeah. Do you, what are your, like, things that you've learned about getting people to open up and getting people to say what's interesting? Because I feel like that's the hard part is like getting to what the meat and the interesting part of their story is i'm just a very endlessly curious nosy motherfucker so i um one i don't do a ton of i do some research but i don't like prepare a list of questions usually um maybe if they're like super famous and i and you know i i want to you know like i interviewed a senator one time i was like i should write questions down for the senator um make their staff more comfortable that i have questions and not that not be like oh i'm just gonna go wherever um but uh you know outside of that you know i just try to connect and then just follow my curiosity from there and i think it also helps where my curiosity is not about when was the first time you had anal unless we're talking about something where like the first time you had anal would be relevant you know so it's like when i interview a porn star you know i don't really care about oh why'd you get into porn unless like it's it's relevant to whatever conversation we're having. So I just feel like we can connect and I'm just gonna follow. And um, I had like, I could have kept asking like, first time this, how'd you, but there was, I was starting to send some like emotion. And I think just like tapping into that was, was helpful so I can follow a way more interesting line of questioning, you know? And how would you, or could you categorize that, the things that you're curious about like would you say you know are they the things that people have big emotions about or i'm way more curious about what you either haven't talked about what you are maybe a little uncomfortable talking about or what like clearly you're you wish someone would at, fucking ask you um you know ideally my show is is less like of an interview it's more of a connected conversation something we might have if uh if there were no microphones around like my i was at my friends this weekend she picked me up we were driving around a bit and i i will in, i fall right into interview mode because i will because i'm just curious and like you can interview me if you want to but otherwise i'm just gonna be i'm gonna ask you like questions that are not like super casual on a casual drive to the grocery store and so i think i like to take that into the into the podcast and it seems to work out because like you know get some interesting stuff out of it what do you wish people would ask you anything I'm not, i am my favorite topic of conversation <laughs> so like doing a podcast where it's <clears throat> that's why i always like throw in i'll, I'll set the tone usually where I'll, I'll tell someone you can agree with me this because sometimes people want to be like a nice polite guest and then afterwards like oh that fucking proceed i no no bring the fucking proceed apart that's more interesting to me again because conflict tension is more interesting than you know the same question someone gets asked but um i i wish people would uh I always throw in, I'll say that you can agree with me, disagree, laugh, cry, but I always be like, and you can ask me questions. Go for it. You know, it's uh, totally fine. <laughs> what's something that you're, what's a conflict, an internal conflict you're working through right now? Fuck. Um, I've been doing like a lot of growth and change type stuff. Like uh, I've been really curious about this whole, the concept of restorative justice, transformative justice. Uh, and like, harm reduction resolution rather than like punitive shit so especially with like what you might call call out culture right so much of it is like you did this you tweeted that and none of it, it and some and people will share how it made them feel but they also are doing it with just the yell and the boycott or the uh, take them off the project and i just feel like that's so not as important as just like well what's going on here like can we dig a little deeper and actually maybe solve something because like, I think if we just like kick people off projects and we don't actually go into like what's happening, we didn't fix anything. It's like when we ban a certain word, I was like, you're not supposed to use that word anymore. I'm like, okay. And I appreciate that that word like maybe makes you feel way, but also if you keep changing the word, the hate underneath it will keep migrating to new words. Um, it's uh, what they call the, the euphemism treadmill, right? right? So it's like, you can keep changing it, but like there'll still be people using a different word in a shitty way. How about we just tackle the hate 
because one, you might not, you know, there might be a lot more words that we could say again because none of these words would matter. Yeah. You know, they, they wouldn't matter if they're, if they're, if that hatred wasn't like attached to them. Um, and so I don't know, uh, I've been working on a lot of like some stuff, like I got into some Twitter beats like in, in like 2015, I'm not exactly proud of. And I've just been taking like a lot of look at that the last couple of years. And what was that behavior about? What was underneath? Um, how can I make amends if there's a pathway to that? And like, what's, how can I take accountability? Right now, like I'm in an accountability mode where I'm like drafting ways to like take some accountability for like things I've done or said to people online. So I can move forward and try to be a better Billy Prasita than maybe I was in my mid twenties. That seems to be a theme for you. Improvement. Yeah, I love looking into the past instead of planning for the future. Um, <laughs> and then when I get done fixing the past, I have something new that I fucked up because I wasn't paying attention <laughs> in the present. It's uh, it's really fun for me. <laughs> uh, my brand is like constant fuck up but trying. That's the thing. <laughs> I think it's interesting as someone with any kind of platform to... What I see a lot of are people who can easily identify with someone being aggressed against um, and people who can identify very easily with someone who would be called out for being an aggressor. Mm. Um, so like when you see people railing against PC culture or, you know, I can't say anything anymore. Um, it's usually like white guys with platforms who are afraid of being canceled. <laughs> and when you see people railing against like oppression and, you know, ableist language and things like that, it's usually people with less of a platform who are regularly aggressed against in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just really helpful for both sides to be able to see themselves in the other role, um, where maybe you call people out differently if you can imagine being on the receiving end of a call out. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you behave differently if you can see yourself, um, you know, being aggressed against. We can also discern like which things need to be called out or which things you need to be involved in the call out of, because like, we could all be calling out a whole slew of people all the time. That sounds really tiring. Um, and it's like, maybe if you go like, do I need to join this call out? Or is that going to only just, is it going to have no effect and just, you know, cause me frustration? So uh, that, that's another part that I think we can all like start working on. Is like, do I have to say something? Because like, let me tell you, as a, as a straight white guy with this face, I've just been like, oh, there's a lot of times I could just like not. <laughs> like I can think it, I can have my opinion. I also don't have to tweet every thought I have. Yeah. Um, and that, that's been helpful. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, I think it's Twitter, especially social media, the internet generally definitely facilitates and promotes these pylons where, you know, someone's the main character and everyone just chimes in on this one person. And it's interesting how it's never like a straightforwardly awful person. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't bother calling them out. Right, so the Legion of Skanks guys, like, we don't waste a lot of time calling them out. Because, like, we know what they are. Right. And they know, they say what, like, there's no misconception here. So you should expect of them what you get from. That's why, like, uh, when, you know, people were mad at Michael Che a week ago. I go, one, you're mad about jokes of his that he hasn't even done yet. He's like, I got, like, five minutes on Simone. I want to do it at the cellar. And now you're freaking out. You don't even know the joke yet. And like, if you hear the joke and then you want to be upset, that's fine. But like, let's wait till we've heard it. But also it's like, Michael Che is a troll. And he knows, we all know that. That is what he is. He's living up to the expectation that has been set. There's no surprise here. Now, when you have like someone who has, says they're like super big feminists and whatnot, you know, that, cause they're, they're, we're talking about like hip, um, hypocrisy, which people tend to seem to be more upset about. You know, the Matt Damon thing kind of went over real quick. Cause like, Matt Damon, did anyone think a dude from Boston didn't say that often? Like, or at least, right? Like, what did you, th Bill Burr had a joke um, from like a few specials back about like the owner of the Clippers who was an 80 year old white guy who like didn't say the N-word but said some disparaging things about black people. And he was like, one, the guy didn't say the N-word once, which is crazy for an 80 year old white guy. <laughs> and then also it's like, what did you think he thought? <laughs> what did you think he thought? <laughs> well, I think that's part of the problem though. Cause like, I mean, I've seen Michael Che on um, SNL, mm -hmm. and that's it. Like, I don't have any context for him. So, like, I didn't know he was a troll. Yeah, on his Instagram, he'll, like, you know, he likes to... He, he trolls a bit, because at this point, like, he gets very obsessed with people who are criticizing his, like, him on SNL or just stand-up. And then also, he, like, he seems to kind of dig the drama of people just yelling at him that he can post on Instagram and people freak out. 
Well, that's, he's... Yeah, that's part of the problem of the way social media algorithm, algorithms work, is that outrage creates engagement. If, if y'all just left him alone, his Instagram story alone, he'd stop doing it. Totally. Oh, and he's being incentivized to do it. But I guess my point is that, like, another problem with social media is that you just, you don't see the context necessarily. You mm -hmm. just see a piece of content that's, like, surfaced into your feed because everybody's retweeting it and shitting on it mm -hmm. um, without necessarily, like, the What rates, happened? Yeah. yeah. What, who, what their pattern is, like, anything like that. Um, I'll DM some people like if I know the person between I'll be like hey well, like I, I can't seem to tell what happened here and that's even if I've chosen to care yeah because <laughs> right. there's a lot of things I have to just choose not to care because most of it is not so monstrous I need to right um, but yeah yeah and I've I've been you know uh, had some tweets blow up in a negative way and some people have done that I've been like hey what did you mean by this and it's interesting I have a friend I was tweeting with today and um, I tweeted him one of my tweets in the DMs and he was like, what does that mean? I'm like, oh, right. Like what I'm tweeting is not obvious to a lot of people, you know, like you'll make a joke, I'm sure. And it's just like, yeah, this is what this joke means. And then people will be like, wait, what do you mean by that? Which also, it's like, I didn't mean anything. It was a joke. Uh, but it's like, it says comedian. I know I'm not funny, but it says <laughs> comedian in the bio, which is the context of don't take this as an, you know, Jim Jeffries has a great line in from a few specials back called freedom and uh <clears throat> freedom was the was the special and he he said basically it's like there's a world of a difference between things that i think and things that i think are funny to say and ever since i heard that I was like that is my that is my go-to now if someone took something too seriously i was like i just thought those were funny those are funny words put in that order because isn't it crazy the problem is we are living in a time where a jo okay so jokes require exaggeration that's what makes a joke a joke um, so when like someone at the office is saying something like really shitty, um, I say, where's the exaggeration there? Um, fuck you. Like that wasn't a joke. You didn't write. You're just an accountant who just wanted to say a dumb racist thing at work. Fuck off. Um, but what, you know, we are right now living in a time where a lot of the exaggerations are now the reality. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to exaggerate from there. Mm -hmm. So like when you hear, you know, where, where we have actual Nazis popping up again mm -hmm. to say some like Nazi-esque thing plainly without too much joke structure without a context of maybe a comedy club or a comedy special we don't know it. like you'd be like of course those kings like it's not of course anymore mm -hmm. right maybe 10 years ago you could argue well, of course not now because right. that you know it's, it's so it's hard to exaggerate past that stuff and, and so now people are taking things seriously because well why wouldn't you those are things that people are saying earnestly in other parts of the internet yeah, I mean, I think that I love comedy. Mm -hmm. I love to make jokes out of very serious things. That's how my family's always dealt with, like, shitty things. That's just my nature. Um, I'm a free speech absolutist, um, you know, yada yada. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think the whole, like, it's a joke thing is usually, like, dumb and cowardly. <clears throat> it is cowardly. Um, I think if it's not done by someone who actually does things that are funny for like as their purpose so to speak well because well, i say that in as much as that's the that's a context like someone's no, job I, is a context yeah so it's like when someone at an office job says some something shitty but there's gatekeeping i understand your point but that's right. also gatekeeping well because i'm not saying that like you can't like you have to be a comic to make jokes just like you have to remember that if you're not a comic and you're just an accountant and you say something that's pretty shitty and there was not really joke structure and it wasn't much of an exaggeration why on earth would someone think you were joking but also if you're a comic and you're and this is what where i'm trying to go with this is like you know haha ha, trans people are make me uncomfortable like that's, that's a not lot a joke of, right but a lot of people who call themselves comics like trade on that right i don't think those are jokes so i still hold those people like i'll hold comics accountable to think i just think that i hold them accountable within a context so if all they said was like trans people make me uncomfortable i'm like Sounds like trans people make you uncomfortable. Um, now, if they wrote a joke, like Chappelle's done some really great jokes. I think uh, Chappelle's done some great jokes that are very pro-trans that people want to yell at him for. And I'm like, because but all he does is hold up a mirror. You know, for example, he has this joke about the the L the LGBTQ in a car together, and how like the T's are in the back, and then the T's might say something like, "I'm thirsty," and they all yell, "Shut up, T!" And everyone, and that's the part because it's like all the other. That's a that's not Chappelle yelling at trans women. That's a joke about how people in the LGBTQ community uh, also still can be super transphobic, right? And it's like holding a mirror up to you. So it's like if that felt a little too real to you, 
maybe you need to take a look at whatever letter you are and talk to your people. Do you think that there's any utility to the punching up, punching down distinction? I think that's a, I, I've never thought that was an intelligent way to express, not what you, not you, but like the concept, punch up, punch down. I've never found that to be a, the, the way to explain what you're trying to explain. It's very simplified and dumb to me. Okay. Um, Cause like, what do you mean up, down? I'm, we're, you're, too, too many people who don't do comedy are thinking like comics, a lot of com comedians are very amoral people. Mm -hmm. When they say like they're truly trying to just find something that's funny that makes them and other people laugh, that it really is sometimes as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people make it way deeper than it is. Uh, I do, you know, like anyone can be the subject of a joke, um, but also like people will say something's punching down um, and I'm like, you don't understand joke structure. Because like if you actually look at this joke, you, you're missing who the... The, and you know who's the the butt of the joke so there's a lot of critics of comedy who i don't think understand how comedy works um you can like make fun of someone who like doesn't need to be made fun of or, or i'm sorry um it is possible to do that and it's shitty okay is what i was trying to say like it, yeah someone has like capacity to do it and i don't think it's like i think it's kind of shitty it's like well why why do you need to do that joke like it, it better be really really funny um it's like yeah, just the whole up down thing. I just it's like most people are just trying to punch. They're just trying to find something that's making a crowd laugh. Okay, well just to break that down a little bit if you don't mm -hmm. mind. Please. Um so we recognize that sometimes jokes have butts. Right. And some are cute butts, some are not good butts, but they're butts. And we recognize that power exists. Mm -hmm. Um and I'm not saying that, you know, obviously like my feminism is intersectional. Uh, you know, it's not the oppression Olympics, but all else equal, power exists. Sure. And you don't think there's any, A, well, I guess there's, I have two <laughs> questions. Like, one is that, like, I think that everyone has a moral responsibility to, you know, do something. To, not pick up on people. Well, yeah, to, like, alleviate suffering, like, fight oppression. Mm -hmm. Um fight injustice and I'm not saying every comic needs that to be their number one priority sure. but I think that to say that like well it's just comedy and so you know I don't have oh, yeah, no, it's not, as a human I don't think that's a blanket save okay I do think in terms of you're trying to determine if someone feels a way I do think it's comedy means I don't necessarily think the things I said out of my mouth I thought that this structure would make people laugh um so I don't think it's like a blanket save you bet you better be able to defend afterwards but i think it's a good starter starting reminder to remind people that they're in a comedy club and they're watching a comedian on a stage in a microphone say things not a comedian in the green room talking to so and so saying some shitty stuff i mean a comedian on a comedy stage into a microphone uh trying to make people laugh says something i think it's safe to say like you, you they may not actually mean what they said there sure. um in terms of the, the punching up down stuff the first priority it's good to have like other priorities but the first priority of a joke of comedy i think still is was this funny is this funny the second is is this funny after that then we come into things of like okay now do i need to tell this joke do i specifically need to tell this specific joke is this a joke that maybe other types of people should be making instead maybe i can toss it to a friend of mine who i'm like hey i wrote this joke doesn't feel right for my set but i thought it might work you know there um who's the butt of the joke uh how bad is the butt of you know how how rough is the joke? Because I also think like, if we are gonna get to a place where we're all like in, on a similar playing field, we all have to be able to take jokes, but you also better be like pretty vocal about, I also wanna build up a society where we are equal so we can enjoy these jokes equally. So I don't think it's enough to just say like, what, we should all, Lisa Lamb now he's like, I hit everybody. I was like, so, and so long as you're also off stage talking about making everyone equal, I think that's fine. Um, but yeah, the first priority is like, was this funny? And, and I think a lot of people forget to judge it on that. And, you know, as society progresses, some things become not funny. Eddie Mur have you ever seen Eddie Murphy's Delirious or Raw? His old specials from the 80s. I've seen one of his old specials. I don't remember which one. <clears throat> they were, when I was in high school, the fucking funniest things I've ever seen. We'd quote them with the track and field guy all the time. We'd be at practice just yelling, Goony go go, right? Just like yelling some bits. <clears throat> I, I probably went about five, ten years without seeing delirious and raw and then i tried to rewatch them and it's really some of the only specials I've, I've i can't really sit through straight through it's very uncomfortable because like when you watch eddie on stage 
um you know he does a lot. it's not even just that he says like faggot like he he you can tell he's on it looks like he's uncomfortable with them too and so there's jokes like I just can't enjoy the same way as when I was in high school and why is because culture moved culture changed so eventually those jokes stopped getting laughs there are jokes like so jokes from that special if someone did something like that today on the stage it's not forget the part about like getting yelled at Mo most audiences aren't laughing <clears throat> honestly if I say something like oh yeah that'll play well in the midwest that's like an insult of like yeah people who are still a little behind culturally will maybe like that but it's like eventually people stop laughing and that's when you're like a good comedian. And this is what Jerry Seinfeld was saying when people, he, you know, people misquoted him about the college campus stuff. It's like a good comic will adjust, rewrite, and progress with that because they want to stay funny. The, you know, it, it's not cute to yell into the microphone your homophobic joke that was great in 92 and then yell like, I did that on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. What are you? This is funny. Not anymore. Some things no longer are funny anymore. And that's... So, so it's, when you talk about like punching up, punching down, I think like as society moves, as culture moves, a good comedian will move with it. And there, so the butt of the joke will move as well. I'm going to challenge you. Please. And take it away. So, totally agree. There are some comedy specials, many, most, that are cringy 10, mm -hmm. 20 years later. And I would argue it's because they were using as butts of the joke segments of society whose humanity we've come to recognize. I think we're saying the same thing in slightly different ways. Right, but I'm making another yeah. point. Okay. Which is that there are some comedy specials, um, uh, George Carlin, for example, mm -hmm. that stand the test of time. Arguably more prog too progressive for his time. Absolutely. Yeah. And the difference is that <laughs> he, I'm going to use the phrase, punches up. Like, he is critical of power, and that doesn't age poorly. But he's also critical of bullshit and just dumb. So he's also, yeah, he criticizes power a lot. He also criticizes your everyday person, right. too, right? So, yeah, and that's another example, like Jerry Seinfeld, yeah. right? Like, it's a little maybe dated in that it's become normal. Um, but, like, yeah, the jokes aren't not funny because they're, like, cringe. They're just like, oh, like, he changed comedy, and so we're used to it now. Yeah. But yeah, I, so I think that's the difference is that if you're making comedy that in 10 years from now, people are going to cringe at, like you're punching down. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And then is that not the free market of comedy where like when you stop, you, look, you can tell whatever jokes you want on that stage and they will, you will get laughs or not get laughs. And if you are not getting laughs consistently, people are not going to want to book you. So it's like, if you want to tell your edgelord shit, like, go for it. Like, see how that does. Because it's probably going to bomb. Because it's probably not funny anymore. And then you will no longer be booked as often to tell jokes on that stage. And you'll start to lose that space to say whatever shitty thing you want. Now you got, then you, some get big enough, they can create their own space. But like, we can't, contr can't control where people want to gather 20 other shitty people to say shitty things. Unfortunately, you know. But yeah. it's like, but it's like, I just think that the, that, the audiences and like the quote unquote comp, the market of laughter, I think, solves that. I think it solves it eventually. I yeah. think what we have to, we don't have to worry about anything. Like, comics can do whatever they want to do. Yeah. I would never try to get in their way. What I'm saying though is that, and I believe this about anyone who has any kind of platform, whether you're a comedian, you're a singer, you're a, you know, a writer, whatever, that ideally you will recognize that you have uh, an opportunity. <clears throat> to move society forward or, uh, you know, hang out in the muck. And that if you, yeah. like you said, yes, if you hang out in the muck and you use society's discomfort with or mockery of disadvantaged groups for laughs, that will work today. It will get laughs. Not nearly as much as you think. Not nearly as much as like it it, it's to. not it's not popular it's not fun you don't get booked as much you certainly don't get as much tv work um it's like it's it's just not good for one's career to but even do that i think i mean that's true to an extent but i think what we're missing is that yes society moves forward but we have so far to go like look at tina fey for example mm. right like she's still making jokes where sex workers are the butt of the joke mm -hmm. people still like it because we're a fundamentally society. horophobic society. Right. Comedians are mirrors to exactly. society. Right. So I don't think comics are, like, causing that. I think comics are... I never the... said they were. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I just think they're holding up the mirror, and I'm all about, like, let's move society along. But not even for... Com 
forget comedy. I want to move things along. Sure. I just think that comedy moves with it. Sure, but you as a comic. But it's like sex work is not like a rights group that like people are nationwide like really respecting as a group yet. Exactly. Unfortunately. Right. Totally in agreement. So, so you as a comic, right. you can either say, okay, it's still okay for me to make sex workers about other jokes. I'm going to do that. I'm going to book tours. I'm going to sell books. And well, I but I, so it's like I don't do that because like right. I don't I'm think not, yeah, I'm not yeah, saying yeah. you are. I'm just saying like we're talking about comedy as a yeah. concept. I'm saying you, you, the the you know royal you, uh, can either make fun of people who are currently still marginalized. <laughs> That's gonna work for you for for a period of time. Yeah. I mean, I think Tina Fey is already starting to see a backlash, but like, um, it's definitely worked for her when she's done it. And then 10 years from now, people are going to cringe. You don't have that on your conscience and everything. Or you can say, hmm, like, is punching down at sex workers, is making fun of sex workers, like, what I want on the record? Like, is mm -hmm. that a, a societal trend that I want to, you know, mine for my comedy? Or do I want to look at, uh, you know, unfair power structures mm -hmm. and make fun of that? I think that the latter is the better comedy. Totally. And it's like, okay, like, yeah, like, that's where I think it's at. I, I, like I said, I think we agree. It's just like, I just don't know what to do. Like, someone has the choice to make do shitty comedy. And like, what am I going to do about it? I'm just going to like, not watch that special. Like, I, you know, I watched the Marlon Wayne special about 20 minutes in. I was like, on the third tranny joke, I'm like, I'm good. I'm out. It could you got some issues. I don't need to watch the other 45 minutes to watch you do your therapy on stage of like, why you think like, I don't know how many more jokes about chicks with dicks you're going to have like that. Where I'm like, this sounds like between you and your psych, dude. Like, I don't need to be part of this right now. And so I just turn it off. And I don't, you know, I probably won't watch the next Marlon Wayans special if there is one. Right. But I still will probably watch Don't Be a Menace in South Central while drinking your juice in the butt. Because <laughs> God, is that a funny movie. <laughs> oh my God. I watched How High for the first time recently. How's it hold up? <laughs> um, <laughs> mixed. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The, the gay jokes in, in <laughs> movies from an hour are fucking dumb. Yeah. Yeah. But so, 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 yeah, like, I think the better, look, I, I, had a, I had a story about the first time I paid, uh, or not the first time, but, like, a time in college I paid for what I thought was going to be a happening massage and turned out to, like, just be, a, like, an escort type, you know, like, and I used to tell this story, and the punchline was that, like, oh, not even the hiring, there's just a craigslist -y hookup, that's what it was. So I told, I had this story about this, like, bl public blowjob in a subway stairwell on like Tuesday, 2 a.m. type of thing on a local train. Like no one's around. And I, I show up as the chick and the guy and we go down and we unzip and she starts blowing us. And I used to tell, I had all these pieces to the story. And the, but the punchline was that like at one point I had to go down the stairs because we heard people coming down. And when I was coming up, I noticed the woman's Adam's apple. And so the, the, the joke is also written with a prior understanding of what trans even really was. So I used to tell that joke and yeah, I get some laughs because it'd be like, oh, it was a dude the whole time. That was like basically the punchline, right? And I said, oh, then and I walked out or whatever and, you know, called my mom and cried or something. You know, that's whatever my you know, punchline was 10 years ago. So I used to tell that story and I told it on a podcast once. And for the first time, a, a friend of mine, the one, the host of the show, you know, who, who happened to be married to a trans man, just said, and... Oh, so it was like, eh, okay, and like, I don't get it. Why is this funny? And I was like, oh, because like it was marked as an M, M, F, 4 M thing. And it was like, well, she is a woman, right? <laughs> but now, I didn't see it as that. I thought like trans women were almost like a separate type of woman, right? right? It was like as if there's men, there are women, there's trans men, there's trans women. As a, I didn't, I didn't know. Right. And when it was framed to me that way, it was like, oh. And then with that new knowledge, the joke no longer makes sense. Right. Just even structurally. Right. You know, because like. She's like, why would she disclose that she is trans? Like, I was like, oh. And then the, I, you know, will I one day revisit that story? Possibly. There's still, I still think there's something funny to like, you expect one thing and you find something else, but the way I'm telling it doesn't work. It's not funny. There's a power differential. It's relying on ignorance. So I might find a way where I become the butt of that joke. Totally. Because really what it is, is I, you know, I thought one thing, oh, it was something else. And, and I didn't have a freak out. Like I just, when I walked, I, at the event, in the subway store, I just walked past him and was like, hey, I'm going to head out. And I just walked by. Um, and I texted the guy. I was like, hey, I'm chill, but, like, you may want to be careful because, like, the wrong dude realizes that that could become, like, a hate crime in the moment. And he was like, yeah, good looking and, you know, get home safe. I was like, all right, cool. That was, like, the actual interaction. One day I'll find a way to make that joke funny where I'm the butt of the joke, but, like, I don't no longer make her the butt of the joke. 
And that's because like my understanding of things changed. Totally. Culture didn't, is not necessarily, is, is maybe lagging behind, but like, you know, that's, that's the best we can do. Totally. And I think as comics start to understand things and social justice, like they also are, I'm noticing after like over a decade in comedy, like as comics learn and understand things better, their jokes do change mm -hmm. and the material does change. And those who don't, they either don't perform as well or they have to like create their own comedy festival in Austin, Texas to be able to do their jokes. You know what I mean? It's like. <laughs> that feels specific, but It's okay. very specific. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not in the comedy room, but um, yeah, no, I think, we're, I think we're, we're in broad agreement. I guess what I'm objecting to, I'm not in love with the punch up, punch down um, framing, but I will say that I dislike the <coughs> flattening of the conversation where it's like either your first I feel like what what people are trying to say is what you said like comedy should evolve and it should have some kind of eye toward justice mm -hmm. um and that I feel like that gets twisted around to I'm not allowed to make any jokes anymore and like you know it, nothing's funny and nobody can laugh about anything and it's like no I mean like things are still funny we the, the first job is still to entertain but like also you're upset that you have to write new material. Like, that's what ultimately they're like. Yeah. They're like, oh, fuck. I had this great half hour that I've been using for the last 20 years. Now I got to update it. You know, it's like, yeah. Or you can just like die off and open up spots for younger comics, which I'm sure we would all support. Totally. <laughs> totally. Um, okay. So. Also, the idea of punch up, punch down. It's like saying, if you just said a very plain thing about like power differentials and shit like that it'd be easier to not dismiss it so easily because just even the phrasing punch up, punch down, such imagery goes in my head that like, I think comics, we just think they're funny words. There's word punch in there. There's just so much we can do with it that we almost forget what we're what we're mocking. We're just mocking this terminology. It's like if you came <laughs> at it with a way more like the boring language way, it's, it, you'd be like, oh, that is a good point. Punch up, punch down. I'm like, what you talking about punching? Hey, <laughs> I'm punching all over the place. I feel like though, if I said like, I think that uh, comics and other people with public platforms should take power differentials into account when they're creating content. Yeah. That's accurate, but mm -hmm. I don't know if that would be any better engaged with, but I can try it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like, I'll put it this way. It's, it's harder to mock the language of it. And at least now they have to come up with a reason why they disagree with you punch up punch down well now we can kind of mess with them and, and, and make fun of the word choice you had mm -hmm. and never actually deal with the issue you were trying to bring mm -hmm. up in the first place yeah it sounds like a comic yeah 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 because like funny. truly there it's a it's a largely amoral people <laughs> like in large mass they're amoral we just want to you know make jokes and feel decent about ourselves because we've hate ourselves on the inside so much <laughs> so it's like we just see that it's that's all i need is just <laughs> get me a laugh and i can sleep at night it's like and so we're not always thinking about that yeah i think the better comics think about it somewhere in their priority list me too yeah yeah i agree well we've agreed so we should move on <laughs> okay, um, let's talk about porn oh yeah uh you make porn that's a weird sentence for me to still like accept and say okay <laughs> yeah why Cause I'm a, I, I, it's like a, <clears throat> we live in a society that's so much about identities now. It's like I don't identify as like a, an adult content creator. I identify as a comedian, podcaster. Because that's what I've mostly been doing. That's what I identify with. You know, I fell into this like, oh, there are some people who want to see my, where my dick's been too? Okay. Um, so, you know, I've even, and even before then, like I've dallied, I've dallied against, dallied? I don't know. I've been around in, I'm a fake smart person. <laughs> So it's like, Me too. I, no, really? Cause I've always, I always took you to be like an actual smart <laughs> lady, you yeah, know, it's fooled. okay. Uh, definitely fooled me, <laughs> but I, um, I've like done various types of sex work here and there in the past, like in college, I, I did, I webcam for a couple years. I was making like a hundred, five hundred dollars a week doing that. Like while writing papers, playing Madden. Did you show face? Yeah, yeah. Damn. I was like, I didn't care because I was already doing comedy. So <laughs> this can be more embarrassing than my set. Yeah, I was like, what is this, what? This is gonna get out and just like, like, <laughs> hopefully, I get famous enough that this, someone would want to leak this, right? It's like, <laughs> it, 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 I'd already committed. Like, I'm going all in on like not having a real job. <laughs> that was early on. Um, so I, I webcammed. I um, I did like a live in person stroke show in college once too. I was hoping I could get more of those where. It's like, oh, come in, I'll just, I, mean, like, I just showed up, this guy gave me a hundred bucks, we jerked off next to each other for a half hour. And he was like, can you come in my mouth? I was like, no, you gotta pay more. He's like, what about, <laughs> the, 
could you come in a cup and I drink in front of you? It's like, I will come in a cup and you can go in the bathroom and you can drink it. You can pay me more and I'll watch you drink it. But like, I don't need to watch you drink that. <laughs> You're um, a natural sex worker. Really? Yeah. yeah. I just, I just pay attention to the grades. Um, <laughs> And then I've like I was a I was a fin dom for like about a year. Uh, fin dom sugar baby is kind of blended. It was like the first half was more fin dommy, and then we kind of made it more oh, boyfriendy, huh? Oh, this was with a lady. Okay. Uh, yeah. So she was in Dallas, and I was in New York. So I actually never even had to do anything. I just the question stands though. Oh, the question stands. I, I put myself there a lot, and just can't like the man part really. <laughs> I like uh, maybe I'm a little more curious about like dicks, but like every time I'm like actually really into the idea, it's always like someone really high femme, or it's like food and nari, so it's not actually realistic. It's like cartoonish, um, okay. but yeah, not the, yeah, no, I I try, but not not for me, the men. It's not for everyone. Yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, I did the sugar baby thing for a year, and and then um, and then it, and I've and I've had a lot of false starts, almost getting like escort work. But, like, I've had a surprising amount of, like, conversations that lead to just falling through. So would you do gay for pay? For, look, everyone's got a number. And anyone who <laughs> says there is no number would do it for, like, 20 bucks. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, no, there's always a price. Yeah. And it's not, like, a million dollars, right? Because that's, that's the guy who's just, like, trying to... I'm like, yeah, no, there's a very reasonable, unreasonable price. Like, it's still unreasonable, but it's, like... It's reasonable if someone was like multi-millionaire, you know, <laughs> like somebody wants to give me like 10, the closest I got was like, I applied for a Craigslist ad and I was like 22, 23 for a live in houseboy thing. Um, <clears throat> it was this couple and I would have gotten free rent on their Upper East Side and they wanted me to, me to like live there, keep the place clean, um, fuck the hot wife whenever she demands it. Cause she's just very horny and the, the, and he travels and. And I'd have to also at like about 9 a.m. every every other morning, let's just say half the month, um, I'd have to get up in the morning and suck his dick. And for that, we're gone free round Upper East Side, free food, drinks, and everything, uh, and five grand a month cash. What? Yeah. Was um, that looking for a woman? No, I was specifically looking for a boy. And and uh, this was a while ago. This is when I was really steeped in my gambling problem. Uh, <laughs> But also had, like, no income to justify my gambling problem. <laughs> like, the gambling problem still manifests plenty in my life. Uh, but it, 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 it was most unreasonable there because I wasn't fucking making real money. <laughs> uh, but So I, I did my first interview. I did the interview via webcam, and he wanted to, like, watch me jerk a bit. Which, obviously, there's red flags of, like, you should get some cash for that up front. But I was just like, I'm going to toss to the wind. I'm going to show off that, like, I, I actually did the thing. Um, he did the actual interview with me. And then afterwards, he's like, I think we're ready to, like, let's do a... Let's get together. Let's have like a, a test night. Let's like let's take you out to dinner. You can meet my wife. Let's see if there's like what the chemistry is. Maybe we'll take you back. If we do, we'll like compensate you for the night. But like, um, let's just see what goes with that. And then like we were looking to schedule, and I was like, oh my god, I might get this fucking job. Uh, but I was also seeing a lady at the time, one of these infamous women who like I'm super into, and just did not want to love me back. She was very much like, come over and like, we have sex stuff. I could not get her to go out to dinner with me. It was very emotionally frustrating. Cause she'd be like, I really like you. The way I show you like how I feel about you is just like, I'm here. Like, I was like, you know, when they say the love language is quality time, it's like quality's in the word. It's like, in, it's like, it's not just that you're here. Um, but I was, I was head that over is, here. That is like fuck boy 101 behavior. I've experienced a lot of fuck boy, fuck girls. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and, and so I was head over heels and I thought like last minute I pulled out cause I was like, you know what? I don't think Natanya's gonna like stick with me if I had, because I would have been allowed to still see her. I just had to, you know, do my duties, but I was like, oh, I think that'd be a tough sell, blah, blah, blah. So I pulled out of that. And then, like, not long afterwards, like, things ended there. To which I quickly rushed to the computer. I'm like, yo, is that gig still open? No? Ah, oh, fuck. Damn. <laughs> Damn, that's rough. Um, but that was probably the closest I got to, like, a gay for pay type thing okay. where, like, we actually talked dollar numbers. So, do you identify as a sex worker? So I complicate, I guess now more so than ever, but I'll just put it this way. It's like, I don't want to go around being like, oh, I'm a sex worker, detract from any attention to the, the you know, maybe the more proper faces to have up on that. Um, you know, I think I've asked one or two friends in the past before I had the OnlyFans uh, and I would just be like, hey, this is my history. And like, should I? And I also entertain open offers for stuff via the, you know, 
via women sometimes who hit me up, guys sometimes too. And I was like, should I, is it bad if I call myself that? Like, does it help the cause? Like, oh, look, we have a very different face you didn't expect. Um, or is it like, is am I seeking attention? So like, I'll call myself a sex worker not depending on like what the people around me think is like proper. Uh, but like by definition, I'm a sex worker. I do sex-based work. Um, and, th but you know, do I identify as one? I mean, it's not part of my like identity, but it's like a fact about me, mm -hmm. you know? My identity is really more in the comedy world and podcasting. Yeah. I think it is helpful to identify as a sex worker. I mm -hmm. do think it's really helpful to have people understand how varied sex work is mm -hmm. and how little you can assume about someone based on the fact that they're a sex worker. Right. And so if it's helpful for the cause, I'll show up to like a thing and you want to use the fate, like, okay. And if uh, you want me to sit down and shut up, like it's, it's one of the spaces I'm in where like, I recognize like, oh, I should sit down, sit down and shut up if, uh, if others are leading this type of a thing. Yeah, and I, I also empathize with the whole, like, I don't re represent the average sex worker, and I would never claim to, mm -hmm. um, but... But you look more like the average sex worker than I do. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, like a hot female-bodied person you don't think is, like, what most people think when they think sex worker? I Thank you. I feel like <laughs> they don't think 35-year-old writer, um... Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But that's the great thing about OnlyFans, especially like amidst the, you know, when, when the pandemic hit, it was like, we started, I mean, sadly, a lot of the stories were like these tragic stories, but I think a lot of people were seeing that uh, it was almost like the, the shitty part was backfiring because I think a lot of people were seeing how many different types of people with totally quote unquote normal jobs and blah, 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 were also selling nudes because mm -hmm. why wouldn't they? And, or if they can, go get it. And I think so that part, at least selling nudes is, is, working its way up the ex the respectability charts for sure <clears throat> and but i also want to note that i think that yes we have seen an influx of people start only fans and you know join only fans and subscribe to only fans um but i think that people are really finely attuned to change and really unaware of defaults and that the default in society is definitely like to stigmatize and ostracize and denigrate sex workers so yes there's been a little bit of progress but like we have so long so far to go well the way people are finding out that like regular everyday people are doing only fans is through these shitty articles like right. we found this emt who does only fans like why the fuck you yeah? have and now she's no longer an emt what'd you do yeah but like through that, people saw, oh, my EMT might be on OnlyFans. Oh wow, like it's almost like they're everyday people. Right. Unfortunately, it's just through coverage where someone's losing their job because they want to be hot on the internet for money because they probably weren't getting paid enough in the first place at their job. Totally. <laughs> or like their kids are getting kicked out of their Catholic school because the mom's on OnlyFans. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it's interesting too, like this whole, uh, you know, people making porn but not identifying as as making porn mm -hmm. um, is super interesting to me because I think it speaks to this idea well I mean first of all I think the difference between art and porn is um, extremely subjective and like not a real distinction mm -hmm. um, so people say like oh I make you know erotica or I make art or you know like anything to avoid the conclusion that i make porn don't want to say the p word yeah yeah which i just think is so silly and sex negative the only reason i hesitate to say is because i just don't want to insult people who make good porn <laughs> that's really that's like art honestly what i get at it's like i don't want to be like i make porn because i'm like if you saw it you'd be like oh <laughs> so i'm just, like it's really more out of respect than like a, some sort of homophobia it's more like i just you can it's like i it's fine if you tell me i make porn i don't want to say i make porn and then like you know den denigrate a profession i mean yeah also the majority of porn is terrible and also the majority of art is terrible the majority of most things are terrible right, right? like that's what makes the great things great absolutely yeah and it's also just so niche right there's anything you make if you enjoy making it someone wants to consume it if like, my porn is great if you are also a fan of Billy Priscilla. It's like, right. that's that's where it is. Yeah, my porn <clears throat> is, if you've ever had a Twitter personality who you've wanted to see naked and having sex, and that Twitter personality happens to be me, 
my only fans is for you. Like as I, like I said, I think you're selling yourself short. I think there are plenty. If you posted on Reddit a little more, I think you'd find that many people would be uh, like, oh yeah, we like this like hot ginger. You know, I have, and um, I just find like I noticed that you did the you do the free, and then you sell your videos for more than I sell. That's because I don't have the confidence to charge an admission. <laughs> Cause like right, cause a lot of people don't realize that like the 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 subscriber chart. It's more like when you go to the strip club, that's the admission, yeah. right? And then everything the unlocks are like when you tip or like buy a lap dance or whatever. Um, but I'm just I'm like I'm more of a free strip club, you know? Like we're just trying to get people through the door, uh, and we'll work on like monetizing once they're inside. That's that's my because that's where my self confidence is. <laughs> it's like if I had abs and a ten inch cock, I'd be like, oh maybe I that's worth twelve ninety nine a month. <laughs> for me it's like uh hey i don't want to deal with a lot of people in my club yeah the more people in my club the more problems i have potentially mm -hmm. and like i'm not into that um but I, the market for you is also bigger sure, sure. for you know yes. people who want to see naked women than naked at very average uh looking dudes uh, <laughs> you know what i mean you're, you're better than average um no for sure but then if the self-confidence of selling my videos for not very much is like, yeah, I know what I want to create and I know I'm not creating that yet. I think my videos have gotten better over time, but like, they're not amazing. I will say like, aspects of them are, are pretty good. Like I'm having a good time, which is better than you can say for a lot of porn. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, like it's camera phones and sometimes I'm out of frame and like, you The know. framing thing. Cause uh, like, it's either do this, the front facing camera, but it's a worse camera or you set it up properly. But then it's like, yeah. I don't know where I am. The, you want to know a fun hack I found Please. in my last apartment and I got to work it out. My new apartment, like it's, it's iffy on it, but you put airplay to the TV and I use the TV as like a monitor. So if like, you know, if I, so this, like we were a front facing camera, if you had it flipped around, but you had a TV back there, I would just have the like air mode, whatever, the airplay to that TV. And now I'm like, I have the monitor to frame myself. And then you just have the TV on mute, I guess. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I have the TV on mute. And that was, I have the better camera recording me while I still get to see what's going on. Smart. Yeah. Yeah. I occasionally have a smart idea. I need a TV to do that, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, <laughs> more little space constraint here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you set up your OnlyFans. Like, what was what was your, your purpose? What was the idea? Is there anything that you want to... Is there any kind of porn that you, like, want to see in the world that you think you could add to it? Um, I... I think in the future there's something I could do. I always... Even before I did OnlyFans, I always had the idea of, like, if my career gets big enough or like the Manor podcast were big enough um i could then in theory like look Manor podcast in part a lot of people want to live vicariously through me and my sex capades and stories <laughs> some choose in for wonderful guests like you some in part want to hear me with my like past partners because they want to hear these stories and all that jazz they're like you know maybe they're a monogamous very vanilla person in utah but fuck does like hear an x y and z story gets them hard or wet or whatever so it would be cool if so right now they get to hear like my sex stories so i think it'd be cool one day to like produce porn of my sex story like because i've like my stories are absurd uh because they're very craigslist and whatnot so it's like i feel like i could make i could produce hot porn of my stories with hotter people <laughs> right like cast ryan griller as me from that subway stairwell story you know it's like <laughs> So um, I think that's something I would like to make one day if my career uh, works for it, if I can get it to a place where I can do that. Why not do it now? Um, I, I, I would rather do it when I think there's like a little bit bigger reach for that. Because also I think there's more capital needed. Because I would hire, I, to hire the hot people. Like, and I would hire like, I would hire the porn. You know, I've, I've interviewed a lot of porn stars. So, you know, I, I would love to just, be able to call Ryan Driller and just be like, yo, hi, it's Billy again. Yeah. Uh, remember me and our podcast? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we were both fat kids, but like you got hotter and I got <laughs> decent. Um, yes. Uh, you want to like star as me in this? I, here's the idea. You know? Oh, yeah. I know you walk into a fucking apartment that has been left completely unlocked and you find a blindfolded woman there and you are to you eat her pussy and you fuck her and do all the things and you leave and she never knows what you look like. Right? Like that's, that was something I did. I don't know, six months ago. Um, 
So shit like that would be fun. To I use. fucking love it. Yeah. I love that idea. I, I, I would love, there's a whole slew of things. Uh, fuck, when I got dumped here, uh, there's a great public porn I could, I could have where it's like uh, the day I got dumped, um, that night I hooked, I, I matched up with someone on a dating app. And so like we arranged to, I had to go find on, I had Googled public parks you can have sex in same uh, Bay Area, which actually had a lot of great results. I highly recommend but I uh, found like some park somewhere in the like East Bay and like at around like midnight, I went out there and I sat in this park bench and I took my dick out and eventually this lady pulled up and she walked over and didn't really say anything. She just like sauntered over and she smiled in her sweats and looked really hot and she just got on her knees and started sucking my cock. Amazing. And then later I got her on the bench, I started eating her pussy and then I bent her over the thing and then I fucked her there. And, Amazing. And then she gave me a ride back to San Francisco. What a nice, like, right? What? You live a charmed life. Yeah. So like those, when I say like I have wild stories, I mean, it's like, it's that type of shit that like I arrange a lot of stranger play, a lot of like interesting group sex scenarios, um, things like that. So I think it'd be fun to produce my stories with hot, hotter people one day. Uh, and I would like to do that when I feel like I've got the bigger audience for it. See, I'm, I'm imagining something like insecure on HBO, but like a porn Okay. I think that would be incredible. Yeah, like I'm, I'm down to, to produce that one day. But I like would I would that. not star in it. <laughs> you know, I'd be like I'd be a, yeah. I'd be a writer. Yeah. Um, I've never written a TV show, but like I feel like I could write a porn. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, erotica has actually been super hard for me to write. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's interesting. Yeah, I would love to do like a. I love television, and I would love to do like a series that's like semi autobiographical, but also is a porn. Um, that would be incredible. Yeah. That would be super fun. But in the meantime, I just want to make porn that's like, yeah, authentic, mm -hmm. where I'm having a good time and they're having a good time. Um, and like is well lit. That's what I'm going uh, for right now. Yeah, Things the aren't even well lit. <laughs> that's the well, there's lots of challenges, but. Um. I agree. Yeah. For now, I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm, the only fans in part is helping me feel better about myself because like instantly I got a boost in my bodily confidence because like now there's a dollar amount assigned to my body. <laughs> Seriously, so I, I, I made a deal with myself. Like I started my OnlyFans like a year ago and so a couple months in I was like, okay, um, if, if I want to ha keep hating my body, I'm allowed to, but I am not allowed to say I'm not hot because like this body paid rent. So like I, right, so that's the, the deal I made with my, with my mind. Um, but then in terms of the stuff I do, like any partnered content I do, I think that's like just showing a look into, you know, the sex capades of Billy Presida from the Man Whore podcast, because, uh, you know, a lot of people seem to like hearing about it. Let's show them some of the shit they get up to. Um, yeah. I, and I don't do stuff like, like crazy produce. Like I, I'm not really like fucking a lot on camera cause I don't know that I'm comfortable doing that yet. So I do a lot of other fun stuff too. I think you and I are kind of similar in that, like, we have our, like, passion project. We have Man Horror Podcast, mm -hmm. I have Sex and the State, and then we do OnlyFans to, like, help support yeah. those, Supp supplement. those projects. Um, and then we have goals for our porn as well. Um, what is your goal for Man Horror Podcast? Keep getting, keep getting big. Uh, you know, I, I want Dan Savage to have to call me. <laughs> that's that's where I would like to get it. <laughs> Do you want to be big for the sake of being big or like, is there some impact you want to have? Um, I don't think they have to be totally mutually exclusive. Uh, getting big uh, uh, gives you the ability to do other things. Mm -hmm. So the more people you have <clears throat> on top of being able to support oneself, just you're also able to do more. You're able to get these types of people. Um, so I, you know, you want a show to get big. So, cause it shows that you're doing something right. Mm -hmm. Right. The, as it grows, you are like, okay, these were good decisions I made. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in terms of like, you know, I try to hesitate from like having a mission because uh, as soon as you have a mission, it's just real easy to like point. I don't know. I <clears throat> I just wanted to share overshare publicly on the internet. It sounds like it's been helping some people. Some you know, that we're like the same person. I'm very into it. It will be great. <laughs> I would really like to make out with myself one day. You know, I've always wanted to. Uh, yeah, I think I th I get a lot of great feedback about people who are learning more about non monogamy or sex positivity, or they're like working on shame or like. You know, if we're talking about sexual assault and they're like being able to like relate to guests because gosh, uh, I stopped asking how'd you lose your virginity many years ago because that's, 
Hmm. Very often, not a good story. Yeah. How many times do I have to, you know, walk into trauma by accident when I'm like, I don't ask that question randomly anymore. Yeah. Um, but what, whatever the topic, like, I, I, you know, people are really taking something from it and they're growing and they're applying it to their own lives. That's great. But like my goal was like always like more inward journey thing. And if people relate to that, that's awesome. Uh, because I know there's a lot of content and shows where I have gotten a lot from them because I was able to relate to them. And I was able to see what did they do. Totally. I think, like, I do have a mission and um, I do have, like, concrete goals, but I do find that people really respond well to vulnerability. People really want to connect. That's why I do my show the way I do it. Why I don't like doing the Zoom ones until, like, I had to. It's like, I think there's going to be so much more had if we can connect, if we can find something where there's maybe you hadn't gotten like with yours, it's like to go into that also adds to the interest of all the other more surface level stuff we talk about. Um, but if you don't go ever get deeper, it's like then then that's an interview that anyone could have done. But I like to think that some of the interviews I do, like few people could have done that interview. And I am one of those people. Totally. Yeah. And I think that like, no one cares about what you think until they, uh, this, this actually quote, it's like, no one cares what you think until they know that you care. I like that. Or cares what you know until they know that you care. Yeah. Anyway, people, people can, like want to connect with other people. And so it's like, yeah, if I have this opinion about whatever, you know, sex work decrim or whatever, it's like, who am I? Where am I coming from? Why does this matter to me? Mm -hmm. You know, people want to know. And I, and I, I respect that. And so I think it's been good for me to just like. A, like, I like oversharing on the internet. I like having my diary public. Um, and and I think people people like connecting. And I think, you know, in recovery, they say you're only as sick as your secrets. And so mm. after we spoke, I had, like, a shame spiral where I'm like, I don't know if I came across well in that. Like, Aww. but then I thought, you know, like, you're only as sick as your secrets, you know? Well, yours broke my heart because uh, a little bit because it's just like, wow, like, th that you just assume, like, I, I fuck up. I don't know if you feel this about all partners and we don't have to get into it, but just like when you were like, I don't want to fuck up his, his shit. And I'm like, it's like this assumption of like, Kathy fucks up people's shit. And yeah. like that, I was like, cause that's, that's tough to date with that thought of yourself. And, totally. and I, I don't think that, I hope that's not the reality. No. And, uh, and so it's something I hope you get to break out of cause then you get to go into more things. But I think that's so much cooler than talking about just telling us the story of the relationship. You know, and that's why we get deeper. And that's when, when someone's plugging books, sometimes they'll be like, hey, so we're going to talk about the book? I'm like, I mean, we can, but I think this is more interesting. If they like you, they'll get the book. You know, if we just talk about the book, then they have to, like, be into the topic of that book. But if we, if they like you, they might get the book even if they didn't think they were going to want to get that book. Absolutely. Always. Yeah. Always. Yeah. And it's all about narrative and that's something I'm trying to get better mm -hmm. at as well. And in terms of goals, like I have causes and things I'm like passionate about. I just try not to make the podcast about them. Like sex work decrim, comprehensive sex ed in schools, gender equality, queer rights. Like those are things I've always just believed in and were common sense things to say. Now, like uh, I think stuff about masculinity is starting to get in there too, become very important because of like what I've been going through with myself and like things I've experienced. And, and so the goal has a lot of, the podcast has a lot of opinions, but I wouldn't say they're necessarily like a mission statement, but like, God, I will not shut the fuck about, up about some things. <laughs> yeah. I think that's something that, you know, when I dive deep into a topic and I start to learn about it, you know, I end up writing these like research papers on the topic and I think that's fine. That's part of my process. But then I just got really weary of that and just started going back to kind of using my newsletter as a diary. I felt bad about that at first. I was just like, no, I need to be providing people with like research and facts and like synthesis instead of just like, this is how my vagina is doing today. But then I realized that, and now that, now that we're talking, I'm like, it's, it is a synthesis. It's like, there are facts and I can back up what I'm saying with research, but we all learn through experience and narrative. And so I'll, when I tell stories about myself and my life and bring in like what I've learned, I think that's better than just here's my argument and here's the facts that I believe and like why you should believe as I do. This is the scary part about being vulnerable on the internet though, uh, especially if you're massing a following and it's over a long period of time. It's um, if you're being vulnerable, especially being vulnerable about faults, 
or things you've done wrong or like or if you're coming across a certain way um there is if you're being very transparent vulnerable there is like an allowance you'll get there's a window but you do have to change and get better <laughs> that's that's something I'm, i've learned it's like oh <laughs> They do want to, like, you know, let's just take the, the dating stuff where they're like, oh, Billy can't seem to get a girlfriend. Like, oh, we were rooting for Billy to find love or whatever. If, if, if I'm not showing them learning things from these conversations, it will stop being cute eventually. Like, I'm 32. I started the show when I was 24. Adorable. Baby face. Cherubic. But, like, 32, it's like, you better have, like, gotten a little better at some stuff. Um, there, was a, there was a guy I met once. He's a, a fan of the show. And he was a member of my Patreon. He's also a friend of, like, my best friend's Patreon, too. And uh, at one point, she, my friend told me what he was pledging, and it was more than he was pledging on mine. So I said, uh, <clears throat> I think I jokingly called him out on it because we'd gotten like a little more friendly at that point. And he was like, Ugh. and this is years ago, but he says like, you know, I think it was like there's something about we want to see that like you're get it, you're improving, you're growing, you're getting better, you're changing. Um, and so it's like if you want to like be tear your heart open out there, that's cool. But after a while, people want to see progress. Otherwise, it is the same tragedy you can have new tragedies you can have new faults over rise you can have new things you're working on but you do have to work on stuff and and progress um or you can go like dumpster fire and get way worse but you can't just <laughs> right it's like if i got like i don't know if i fell like into the an old white rabbit hole uh they're probably find an audience for that at least it's it's dynamic yeah right but you can't just stay struggling you have to get if that's the path you want to do publicly which is nice because then there's a silent pressure like there's, there's people waiting to hear that I, I'm doing a little better, I better, you know, go therapy. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, I was actually watching There Will Be Blood for the first time recently. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to think, I've been thinking a lot about what makes a story good or bad because I'm trying to work in more narrative to my writing. And I'm not a natural storyteller. I'm very much a natural, like, make an argument kind of person. Mm -hmm. And I was like, one of my main criticisms of it is that the main character doesn't evolve at all like he starts out a shit bag he ends a shit bag he makes a lot of money in between yeah. but like that's not a character arc that we can get invested in so i think that's absolutely true you want to see in any narrative a character you know get better in some way learn something yeah we all or, or change in some way i think is i mean ideally they get better but we're also down for narratives like where people get worse we just sure. want we just want to see change over two hours sure it, it's hard to just sit there and be like shit bag shit bag shit bag shit bag can he get maybe shittier because like then that could i could i could stay interested yeah totally. <laughs> i'm just choosing to try to like be the i would like to be the best billy uh that i can be or at least strive towards that uh, as i approach death one day <laughs> I've been blogging since 2009, and I would say that I am definitely less shitty in some very mm -hmm. serious ways. Um, but yeah, no, I think that's that is definitely you know just bearing all for the internet without any kind of development is is not where it's at. Um, but I think one thing that I love about the internet, I rag on social media and all that like a lot because I think there are a lot of problems with it. But what's been wonderful about having like a modicum of, uh, of an audience is that it's made me better where I've put myself out there and I've said, this is what I believe. Mm -hmm. And then people have been like, no, you're wrong. And I've gotten a lot better at admitting that I'm wrong faster and updating my beliefs more quickly and being less egoic and like, you know, committed to, I have to have been right. Mm -hmm. um, and more just like, no, like I was wrong. People are wrong. More information arises, you update. That's fine. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, that's been a really like fun evolution. Well, it's been a good evolution. For yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't mean you can't backslide a little bit just as long as the backslide isn't like regress to like, oh, now we're back here. It's like, yeah, no one's perfect. Like I'm, I'm going again to an argument. Like sometimes I'll tweet some, I'll do a tweet reply and I and I instantly go delete because like mm, I don't know nope, that's not what I need to do and sometimes you you're gonna say things and think you're right and then you know like I have a core circle of people who I trust to call me out and like you know if people want to yell at me on the internet for something okay but there's a core group of people in my life who I trust where I could go to them and say hey do I actually have it wrong here or if they text me and say like you got you know I'm just gonna listen I'm not gonna argue with them very much uh, even if I don't agree, I'm, so like uh, about a week or so ago, like someone texted me because I tweeted something about the Michael Che like stuff that was going on, and she, and she said uh, like you should delete that; it's really not worth it. And then she said some other choice words because she was like 
otherwise pissed and she like kind of apologized later she's like sorry if i was a little too fucking angry. i was just pissed you know so yeah that's fine I, you seemed upset and i was like that's why i did delete it before i even asked why i deleted it then i'm like what's going you know because i trust because like i trust you to not be overreactionary and i know that you like me and i know that this is coming from a place of like you care because most of the internet doesn't care and that's whatever like i can drown that out and i just need to know i can trust people that if they say it that wow that must be real that must be you know allison's pissed she's not normally like this so i i i'm just gonna listen and even if i don't get it i'm just gonna listen to that tell me more about the evolution you're going through with masculinity um so a couple years so i've, I've been in a group therapy since like 2018 with dudes vaguely my age um i forget if we if this came up when we were talking on the podcast and so <clears throat> So, uh, I, one, I struggle being with other, talking to dudes, because, like, dudes are the ones who made my life, for the most part, like, living hell for the, a very large chunk of my years. A lot of my trauma comes from just <laughs> boys being boys. Uh, so, but I need to get into a therapy, and, and this one uh, presented itself. So I did that, <clears throat> and about two years ago, like, not long before the pandemic, like, fall of 2019, I remember we started, like, really getting to this concept of, like, good guys and bad guys. And how a guy in his head will go like, well, I'm a good guy. I'm one of the good ones. So when there is a criticism that possibly challenges the paradigm of I'm a good guy, well, I couldn't have done that because like I'm one of the good ones. So it must have been something else or you got it wrong or this, that and the other thing because I'm a good guy and good guys don't do bad things. So I now must fervently defend and possibly harm people in the process on top of any harm maybe already caused. <clears throat> I've got to defend this image. And then, you know, my, my therapist started introducing us to this idea of like, we're both good guys and bad guys at the same time. Like no one's perfect. No one's a good guy or not. It's just that you're human. And when I started accepting that I am simultaneously a good guy and a bad guy, what, basically when I started accepting a paradigm, like a worldview where, oh, I am kind of a piece of shit, which is something I would say jokingly and mock to dismiss the criticism of it. When I accepted, it, I was like, no, actually I am in some ways at sometimes shitty and at sometimes in some ways i'm great that's when i was able to it was the first it was one of the many doors that I had to get unlocked for me to go down this like path i'm trying to go down i was like oh so if it's because it's also with that idea is that like it's also okay that you are part good part bad right uh so i'm like oh it is okay i'm part bad so i don't have to fucking <clears throat> you know, defend anytime someone wants to challenge the idea that Billy's not a good guy. It's it's okay. On top of it, I might learn something and then be able to fix it and then be maybe a better version of me. Just free. Because now when someone, like, criticizes, um, even if I disagree, I can go, like, like thank you. You know, I don't have to think that it's challenging who I am. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I can even go, like, ah, oh, like, well, well, what if they're right here? Let's just explore. Let's pretend I'm right I saw tweets of somebody, somebody made back in like May. I, I, I shouldn't say stumbled upon. I was, I was looking, I was looking to see like, oh, is somebody criticizing me? Mm -hmm. um, found, found some stuff from, from, from an old thing. And I thought, wow, okay, how about she like the the wording? It just seemed like she was still traumatized by it. And I know I'm traumatized by what happened, and what happened was something I caused because it's on Twitter. It's me and my fucking dumb thumbs. And, and so I was like, okay, so like, what if? Either she's like really holding on to a goddamn grudge or maybe she's actually traumatized. I know I'm traumatized by it. So like she could probably be traumatized by it too. And so these other people probably could also be somewhat traumatized by it. So like, let's just explore that. Let's just like, let's try accepting it. Let's try on the shoe. Let's just see. And then I was like, ah, oh, fuck that. It does make more sense that she's actually traumatized. All the other stuff makes sense. And that's like a bit something I've been reckoning with for like, you know, a good chunk of this year is like, going through that and being able to say the words like i did the thing i did the, i said this i saw those screenshots that was me um one guy in the therapy was like billy i mean he was saying it in a more dismissive way but he had a good point he was like um he was like okay why can't you just say like yeah I mean, yeah i harassed her and and then wouldn't that like cease the criticism like wouldn't somebody be like like he was trying to get to like get people to deflect. But I was like, oh, that's actually a good point. <laughs> what if I just said, yeah, I did that. Because I did do that. So why don't I just say that? <clears throat> the first time I said it in the world didn't end. Um, people didn't like massively unsubscribe from the podcast. So I was like, oh, okay. Like I can just say that. And like, it's something I know I'm not doing. 
I haven't been doing, I've been changing the behavior and working on things that cause that behavior. And then I even started doing like, where else has that behavior or the cause of that behavior been manifesting elsewhere in my life? And I found a, um, in my booking practices for the podcast, in the er especially in the earlier years, um, with my past, at, when past hookups, I was able to find some stuff there where I was like, wow, I was being shitty here too. So let's look at that. Okay, where can I make, so right now I'm in a place where I'm like trying to, <clears throat> I went and identified like, okay, who do I maybe owe an apology to? And I'm like right in the process of a, not like long winded shit, but just trying to like really succinctly in a compact way, go like, you know, hey, I think I did this. In some cases, it's like, I know I acted in this way and like, that's not my bad and it's something I'm working on, and I, you know, and I just, I just, you know, I'm sorry. And, uh, and I've got a friend or two I'm like working on that stuff with this idea of transforming to justice. I think it's the masculinity stuff is so tied to it, uh, for me at least. Totally. And, and so, yeah, like being accept that, I'm, I'm, a, I'm going through, I'm being able to go through that process. And it's, it, let me put it this way. I fought and I was defensive and I was like, they're being this and they're being sensitive and it's, oh, come on, okay, like I was an asshole, but it wasn't this word you're using. Um, you know, so they were using the word like harassment for like the Twitter, you know, the online, the digital interactions we were having. And um, I, did, I didn't think that was an appropriate word. And you know what, even if I still don't think it's the appropriate word, it's not a very wrong word for it. <laughs> I can just say it because ultimately what I care about is that like, what, what, like I said, when I, when I accepted, okay, what if she's actually harmed by this shit? Cause I know I'm harmed by it. Fuck, well then like I owe her a fucking apology. It doesn't matter what the word was. I could say it and like I can, you know, try to make amends. In that situation, I'm not like allowed to make amends. I'm not supposed to reach out, so I'm not. And I'm just, but like, yeah, it, it's It wild. sounds like a 12 step program. Um, you know, anything to avoid Gamblers Anonymous. Uh, Cause like that's a 12 step program I don't want to do. But I will say like, once I stopped being so defensive, I did feel, I feel so much more peace. Yeah. Like I fought for many years, found no peace. I am accepting and just in like the span of even months, I am like, you know, a, a year or so, months, six months, like I am, I feel so much more peace about it. And I feel like I'm not guarding this secret that is going to explode on me, but rather like something I'm working on. And, you know, the way I'm choosing to do it is like I would like to do in a semi-public way um, and be able to like take accountability for what I did. And that way I can move fucking forward. Totally. Yeah, I remember I was in some... I do normally talk about, like, uh, my, my days as a Twitter troll as foreplay. Yeah, I remember I was arguing with some, like, right-wing people on Twitter, and they, I guess, did, like, um, you know, a search of my account for bad words and found a tweet of mine where I used, uh, I want to say a homophobic slur. I'm, I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but... And they brought it up, and it's like, this you? And I was like, yeah. That was, I don't know, 2015, 2013? Um, oh, was, we were problematic in the same years, I guess, sounds like. I mean, I'm sure I'm problematic today. 2015 was like a, just a really tough tweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so struggle, struggle years. Um, yeah, I was just like, yeah, that was wrong of me. I'm sorry uh, to anyone I offended. Like, I deleted the tweet, and, you know, and not to erase it there are screenshots like i'm not gonna try to pretend like it didn't happen yeah. but just like so other people don't get offended in, on my account and um yeah it took the wind out of their sails it's just like there's nothing more to really right. say unless like you can like, identify a real big pattern of behavior it's just like oh well at least you know it's kind of, you know eight miles so you know in a way it's almost like eight miling oneself it, it is something i'm trying to do where it's like let me just like take care of this on my own because it's something i need to take care of anyway and you know what? If anybody else wants to criticize, I, I can be like, yeah, what you got? You got anything else? Okay, cool. Cause I'm like trying to do some things over here. <laughs> I got many years of tweets. Like you're going to find problematic tweets. I don't personally do. I mean, I, I don't think it's, it's your decision if you delete tweets or not. I don't delete tweets mostly um, because I do want to show progress, not perfection. Like if you, if anybody made the terrible decision of reading all my tweets from, <laughs> from 2000 fucking, you know, 10 to now, uh, I think it was my 11 year Twitter anniversary the other day. Oh. And, uh, you know, I think you would definitely see an evolution in like my thoughts. And it's like, I deleted some tweets here and there, but it's usually because I'm just like, Ugh, even in my old mindset, I would think this is hack. <laughs> yeah, same. I, I don't know. I, I'm not a journalist, but I, I kind of have like a journalist eye towards the public record. And I think that it's useful and I can't remember shit. So it's helpful for me to have it written down. And it's interesting, yeah, to see how I've evolved on things. And, um, you know, when I write my tell-all, it'll be useful. 
Yeah. It speaks to exist. So, yeah. Um, anything else we should touch on? I mean, there's like things to touch, but like to touch on, I think that, that that's uh, that's on you. Yeah. yeah. Anything anything else you want to cover? Is there anything else like you're curious about or want to know about me? <sighs> Pro I mean, I'm sure, but um, yeah, about touching. <laughs> what do you think? I mean. Are you asking like my opinion? Uh -huh. Yeah, like I'm. Yeah, you're really cute. Like I, when when I came over for the thing, I was like, maybe hey, she'll like want to shoot like a content thing. And, but it was like no, but like, like you're here as podcast. So because I'm trying to also maintain like that for my my behavior boundaries and like knowing the context of things I'm in. So it's like, um, you know, like to you, like I think okay, I'm a strange man on the internet. Like I'm coming over to her home. Let's like keep it as a pot. She wants to approach the only fans thing. That's fine. And then you did on the way out, and I got all like fucking nervous and giggly because like I you know however I look like I'm an adorable little bitch like I just I was like oh my god yeah I mean we could do a thing like I'm just you want to okay yeah, let's do it. yeah see my assumption was you're making a podcast about sex and interviewing hot girls about sex <laughs> I mean I totally I, doing it. I totally interview ugly women too I swear <laughs> uh, you know it's it's <laughs> I would, I would totally use it as like a, hey, you know, while I'm here. I, I mean, like I could, I know I could, but it's like, I also know like that's not the best look <laughs> in these days, especially. And then like, we think about the whole, like, uh, like I, I don't even like using power dynamics. Sometimes it's not power dynamics. It's just more like just context and shit like that. So it's like, there's context where I could like hit you, like after I left your apartment, if I thought like, if I thought there was chemistry, then I think it's appropriate for me to shoot a shot so to speak right <laughs> um but i also like couldn't tell like you know i didn't get any indications you were like interested so I, that's why I, that wouldn't have been my plan yeah um but like i also don't want to be the creepy dude who's just like oh yeah do you want us to do some naked things <laughs> so you know so you want to like avoid that too so i'm happy you said what you said when you did because i was like oh great i really hope we can make that work it's hard in 2021 <laughs> to uh you know, to sexually harass your coworkers. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I appreciate when pretty people sexually harass me, uh, <laughs> but that's, you know, it's not a popular opinion, it's totally fine. <laughs> it's a real challenge for me because, like, I am not very, um, it's weird because I'm, in a way, like, extremely easy to read, but then also I'm constantly, like, misread. Really? Because yeah. I mis I read you as, like, uh, very, like, neutral to good on the on the interaction like i was i felt like i was getting good stuff from you but i didn't feel like we i didn't know i didn't feel like we were clicking but i also like mirror like i'm just gonna like if someone's getting giddy about me i can oh cool now i can let my giddiness out type of thing yeah um so i didn't think you had any interest yeah uh but i thought i was getting good stuff from you so i was like all right cool i'll keep asking i'll you know keep digging we'll get a good episode here yeah um so i was like all right yeah like because as soon as you asked of course i would um, I, I hope that, I hope we have mutual interests of like what to do. Uh, but like, yeah, well, I can do something, please. Yeah. I, the one thing I thought about asking, but because I didn't get any reads is I think if I had gotten like more positive, uh, maybe visually positive feedback, maybe more spiral, uh, more smiles and laughs and stuff. Um, I think I would have been like, we should do like a, like a mutual butt grab pick, like, <laughs> for, like for the podcast promotion. So we'll like, we'll like pull short sound bit. Dude, that is like that was that was as, as far as I had taken it. But That's um, funny. yeah, like what would what would you yeah? What's your opinion on um the touching of the stuff over the camera? Out? Yeah, I'm 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 you know I brought it up because I was interested in it. Um, what what are your favorite things to do on camera? Um, uh, come. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's usually a favorite. <laughs> uh, below that is making someone else come and then after that is uh everyone coming uh, uh yeah i i'm like really an easy to please type person like i just really like connecting with people and and doing what feels good i went i can't say i'm not kinky anymore because my friend did tie me up with leather straps uh two days ago so i was like yeah Lindsay, i don't think i can say i'm not kinky but i wouldn't say i am like a actively kinky person but yeah like i honestly like what 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 I'm so much more interested in like what you had in mind when you when you asked or what it is you would like to do with me because um that's I'm, I kind of mirror and I'm a big pleaser type mm. even if I'm taking charge in a situation or if I'm like 
really putting on a dom mask, so to speak. It's like, I'm doing it because I know that's what she wants and what she's really into. And so I get really into it because I know that she wants me doing this fucking uh, thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if that's not a son that was like shared or son I'm sensing from them, like, I don't, it doesn't do it for me. It only do it for me because they're so excited. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just, I like touching, I like kissing, I like licking, I like being, like, I like being stroked. I like all, I really like, a lot of the basic things and then there's even some extra things I can get really into if uh or that I'll down the try when when properly pitched yeah. <laughs> yeah I think I used to think that I was kinky and then I started like you know reading about kinky. then you meet kinky yeah people, and then you go like, like oh no <laughs> it's like your average person would call us kinky right. but like a kinky person would would be like that you're cute <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's sweet oh, oh you don't want because like one time I was with um I was like on my knees for like in like a DS scene and she goes like and I was on a wood floor and she was like do your knees hurt and like I didn't I don't know BDSM very well so like I was asked the question I answered honestly <laughs> so I was like yeah a little bit and she's like do you want a pillow and I'm like well I mean if you're, if you're off uh, and she's like, okay now afterwards later like out of scene she did say like yeah I mean it was a little bratty of you uh, or is just like, yeah, you're supposed to be like, no, mistress, like, I'm fine. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know the rules. I just, <laughs> maybe this isn't exactly my thing. <laughs> That's extreme. Like, hearing a question and just answering it straightforwardly is, like, extremely relatable content. <laughs> yeah? Is that something you do? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, that's my default. It takes me a while to be like, oh, there's subtext here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Wait, so did you think I was cute when I walked in the door? Or was it only just through the talking stuff? I mean, you're a, you're a handsome man. Sick. <laughs> I love compliments. <laughs> that's why I say on my OnlyFans, I'm like, if you're not giving me cash, you better give me some damn good compliments. Oh, that's why I started it. Like, the cash is nice, but yeah, for sure. I am all about the validation. Yeah. Um, what have you gotten the most compliments on that you've created? Well, just in general, my they, they're really into the eyes. Um so like if I can do when I do like pussy eating content, uh, I'm trying to I think I want to do more of that because I hear that it's not there's not enough out there, uh, like POV, me going down on the person, uh, because then they just get the you know, they get to see a lot of my tongue, but they're seeing a lot of eyes and apparently they like those cool. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I got I'm trying to think if there's anything in particular I got a lot of. But I think just like when I do partner stuff, it gets people really excited, and. I did get like a compliment recently where like I did a video where like I, I came like particularly hard and so I got a lot of like wow this is like a fire hose <laughs> so yeah it's like three hours of edging will do to you and then you realize oh I should probably record this finishing part it's gonna be pretty big <laughs> I, 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 sometimes I accidentally edge myself for hours because I forget to come <laughs> that's awesome yeah I'm just sitting there at my, at my desk like jerking off slowly stroking and and then next thing I know I'm like oh it's been like two hours I, I should probably finish before my balls start to hurt. What are you watching? <laughs> it depends on my mood, but I hop a lot around a lot of subreddits. Oh, okay. So, also, like, not for nothing, like, I was kind of, like, prepping myself, um, like, an hour before I got here, and, like, had a little, like, 20 minutes solo time, and it didn't come or anything, just wanted to get myself, like, nice and excited, and I was really just, like, reading personal ads here in San Francisco, because those are hot. Huh! Um, I never thought about that. Or, like, giving myself the, con like, I didn't plan on responding to ads really, but like just the thought of like, oh, I might respond to this ad. That yeah. was like, oh, this might be something I would yeah. go do. Um, Potential was very hot. Potential is very, very hot. Um, Fudinari stuff has been like kind of very interesting. What is it? Fudinari. So Fuda is like, it's usually cartoon and it's the idea of it's like, it's usually some kind of like high femme person um, and they have like, you know, she'll have like a, like a monster cock. Like a, something that's not believably big, and then she's fucking so. And then sometimes they're creatures or an animal or like semi humanoid esque. And sometimes it, it's just like a really, like almost like bimbo five trans woman, basically, with like, you know, something like as long as the whole arm. And then she's, you know, a, a, a trope, and it would be like fucking someone from the side, and then they'll show like the inside of the of the cis woman that they're fucking, and they'll show the dick, in, like they'll show the vaginal canal and the dick going up farther than actually is is correct but mm -hmm. so that's been hot um gentle femdom's another uh subreddit i really like mm. 
because it's very adorable. What is it? It's it's like very cuddly dom stuff. Okay. Um, like what's an example? Uh, can, can I can I do it? Can yeah, I show you? Can you, can you come? I'll pretend that you're me and I'm I'm the dom lady. Okay. I'm, so come yeah. uh, come uh, into my arms like okay. you're back to me like back lay into you. me. Okay. Yeah. So I I might be holding you and then like also jerking you off while oh, it's like petting your head. That's nice. Yeah. So you're gonna <laughs> come for mommy type stuff, you know? Um, so that's like an example. <laughs> Of a fem, a gentle femdom or something, just something where it's like it's femdom but softer. Okay. It's cuddlier. Okay. Um, almost like the aftercare images will be hot. Yeah. And they're also typically cartoons. Um, okay. I, I mean, if we're talking about the body type subreddits, I'll go to. I mean, you love our thick, uh, gone wild. I like public stuff. Uh, glory holes, group sex. Um, I love. Uh, hold the moan is good ones public. Mm -hmm. It's like a public sub sex subreddit because you gotta hold your moan. Mm -hmm. Someone's gonna hear you. Mm -hmm. um, someone's sleeping next to someone. You're fucking mm -hmm. someone that you know that yeah. type of stuff. Nice. That's really hot. Um, glory holes got hot during the pandemic. <laughs> I had a glory hole at my apartment. <laughs> it was quite successful. Where? In my apartment. No, but like. In Bushwick, uh, no, no, <laughs> like we want, we want people. Yeah, it's, it's, it's currently not up anymore. But <laughs> so it was a board. Okay, so I did a curtain, okay. uh, but so my apart the my last apartment was two floors. I had the whole basement, right? Okay. Um, and so it had through the laundry room a, a door to the to the street. So in theory, I could like prop open the. It's partly why I got the apartment. Um, uh, because I just it was the first thing I thought of. I was like, I can put a glory hole here. Is like so if I prop open the door to the street and my door, uh, and I give the person instructions, like they could come in, and then I had this hallway that was just mine, and the hallway opened up into the bedroom space. So I hung a curtain where the hallway opened up, so someone can I prop the doors open, they can come in, kneel in front of the glory hole, suck my dick, and leave. Hmm. And then I just like hope I don't feel a beard, you know? It's like, mm -hmm. uh, and it was pretty great it's fun, to the point that uh, one of my repeat visitors. Uh, she ended up doing the podcast <laughs> through the glory hole. Oh my god, I love it! <laughs> you want to love her for a moment? When I pitched this and we're finalizing, she like it was like a day or two before. She's like, just like, is it? Would you be okay if like I blew you one more time as a stranger before we started? <laughs> Right. Oh my god. So she came in as she normally did. She sucked my cock and I actually turned on the recording. I turned on like the mic like as I saw it felt like I was getting close because I want to capture the orgasm on mic. So like I come and then you know you don't hear there's no cutting like you just hear us pretty much like her clean up. You, you can hear that we're getting ready and like I sit down and she had a chair on that side as she pulls up and I suck a microphone through the hole to, for her to hold and then we talk for an hour. I didn't know what she looked like. She didn't know what I look like. She didn't even know the name of the podcast she was doing. <laughs> Which is hilarious because I had made her podcast like like live show posters in, in that hallway. She thought this is hilarious and I hope that you were a super fan? She thought I was a fan of something <laughs> called the Man Whore Podcast. <laughs> like I hope that person exists. I'm sure they do. And then at the end of the conversation, we on mic pulled back the curtain for a live reveal. Oh my god. It was great. That's incredible. And then we ended up hanging out afterwards and fucking. But like, uh, amazing. But like, yeah. What it was a really happy fun. story. You want to hear the unhappy part of it? Yes. During the podcast episode, she reveals that like before the first time she came over, she she sent my username to like a gay friend of hers and said, "Hey, I don't want to look past. The, I don't want to look anything because I really want him to be a stranger. But can you just like take a look and just like give me an idea of like you don't have to describe him, but like tell me how you feel about his look." He texted her back, girl, love yourself. <laughs> I just got my dick sucked. And now I'm I'm talking to a stranger through a curtain. And then I have to hear about her gay best friend thinks I'm ugly. <laughs> like, that's what my career involves. And I just have to roll with those punches and be like, okay, cool. I'm not crying. Tell me more about this. <laughs> How'd you feel? Why'd you still come over? <laughs> she thinks he was wrong when we ultimately pulled the curtain back. But. Oh. Jesus, I was like, tell your friend to fuck himself. <laughs> you know, no one's for everyone. <laughs> I'm clearly not for... And he's not for you and you're not for him. That's okay. <laughs> but you're for her and that's amazing. Yeah. And we got a good episode out of it. It's yeah. called the Glory Hole episode. You have really broadened my horizons about anonymous sex. 
Oh my gosh, you can do so much once you like get past the I might get murdered part. <laughs> <laughs> Which for you is so much more of a reality, sadly, than for me. Uh, it's not that I'm impervious to like you know stab wounds and gunshots, but like you know it's less likely that. Uh, but but there are, here's the thing: it's like I, you talk about like what's a mission. Well, here's here's one thing I like to try to share with people is like if you have a fantasy, like you can most likely if it's not like fucking centaur porn, mm -hmm. it's like you can most likely safely accomplish most fantasies. Yeah. And it breaks my heart that so many people have like such a. Oh, this is the thing I want more than anything else sexually and they just they don't think they can get it because they think it only like exists in porn like a glory hole or stranger play like in a park like that <clears throat> um, they think that that can only happen in a porno or like that's how you get murdered it's like okay but you there are safeguards you can do and I go you know I like I share those depending on what the scene is and so I'll help people out with that because it's like fucking get it like go get it's your fantasy it's your number one fantasy like go get that yeah, I mean, I think it's also totally fine for things to remain fantasy. It's fine for that, but like, yeah. if it's if the reason you're not pursuing it's it is fair. simply just because yeah. like you're worried about getting murdered or you don't think it's like logistically possible, yeah. it's like I say, hire me as a fantasy fulfillment consultant, and like I will figure help you figure out how to make that happen. Whether it's like how to like have a spicy kinky night with the husband, or like hey, we would like to organize a gang bang, but we don't even like know how to start. Yeah, and then I'm like, I can I can help. Yeah, I think um, one thing that really makes me sad about sex is that there's so much to do that you will probably never even think of that other people are doing and like enjoying and you might enjoy. There's no good way to like know what people are doing. We gotta get tapped. That's where you gotta get tapped in the community. Yeah. So like, I have a Discord server, the Champagne Room, and that's where you know it, it, it's free to be a part of. You, there are people in it who don't even listen to my podcast. It's just like it's a place where like like-minded people can go, and they don't just talk about sex. They talk about like gaming and politics and wellness. And like right now, we're doing the hundred push-ups challenge in one of the channels together. It's like, but we have Sexual Achievement Sunday, where like every Sunday people are gonna share their like slutty stories from the week. We have like a sex toy recommendation channel. It's just about that. Um, and then in general, like the conversation span from the sexy stuff to like generic stuff. So it what's if you can find community, you can come, you can be like, oh my God, Cheryl did that. Hey, Tom, we should do that. I, uh, it's, it's, so that's just so many people are so scared to like share totally. with other people about sex stuff of all things. So they'll openly share a murder podcast, <laughs> right? But the sex one's the one we got to, you could lose your job over. Uh, right. It's but but yeah. I think when you find like-minded people, when you can find community, like that's where you can start getting this like idea exchange. Hey, you know, we were thinking about doing something like that. Anyone got any Has anyone ever done you know, handcuffed to a, a a bar on top, like hanging? And what kind of bars have worked out for you guys? Is there a type of plumbing I should avoid? Like, mm -hmm. oh, we have these types. You guys think this is safe? Like, yeah. That's where you can start doing. It. When you find like-minded sluts, you can uh, you the the the, the possibilities open up. And you're doing the Lord's work as a community, like, organizer and moderator. Like, moderators of the Unsung, Unsung Heroes of the Internet is mm -hmm. my, my take. Um, anyway, do you want to make out? Yeah. Okay.